In our last episode, we got sidetracked on the way to Vault City by stumbling upon the town of Modoc. There we solved many of the town's problems, picked up a wife or a husband, optionally, and learned about another location that might have a Gek. Remember, we are going to Vault City because Vic told us that the person who gave him the canteen was from Vault City. But Sheriff Joe at Modoc told us that he thought the people of the town called Gecko might know where we can find a Gek. But which one do we choose? Well, for now, let's head towards Vault City. It's closer than Gecko, and it was our original destination. We arrive in the dead of night. We find guards posted outside, but they don't seem terribly concerned with our presence. Heading inside, we can begin to explore. The first building by the gate is the greeting office, but inside we find no one to greet us. There's a monitor with nothing interesting on it, a locked locker with a first aid kit inside, and next to this is a locked desk with a stim pack and $50 inside. To the right of the monitor is another locker. Inside we find a Geiger counter. And that's it for the greeting office. I figured that maybe the person who was supposed to greet us was sleeping. So I waited until morning, but no one ever showed up. Moving left, we find a big caged off area. A pen? Inside we find people wandering around. One man says, talk to Wallace if you're looking to get into the city. The pen is guarded by armed guards. If we try to activate the gate, they tell us to steer clear. Our presence is bothering the locals. As we walk around, they call us desert trash. We don't need your kind around here, they shout. Just north of the jail, we see a shack. There's a man inside. He says he has no idea where all the Brahmin crap keeps coming from. Hello, stranger, I'm Ed, the local Brahmin dealer. Can I help you with something? Ed, this is the guy. The guy Vic said he got the Vault 13 flask from. We can say, my friend Vic here says he bought a water flask from you. Ed says, oh yeah, yeah, I remember. It's been a long time, Vic. A water flask, huh? What about it? We can remind him, you sold one to Vic, remember? But he says in order to jog his memory, we have to show it to him. So coming back with one in our inventory, we can ask him where the flask came from. But he says, you know, I can't quite recall. I had a bunch of them for a long time. I think I picked them up during one of my Brahmin drives. I didn't need them much when I settled down. Oh great, he doesn't remember? We can ask him if he can tell us more about the Brahmin drives. And he says that when he was a lot younger, he used to drive Brahmin through the big circle. Broken Hills, New Reno, Redding, The Den, and Modoc, and then come back here. He says that it just got too dangerous after a while, so he settled down. He marks all of those locations on our map, and we can ask him if he remembers at which of those locations he found the water flask. But he doesn't remember. The Brahman drives were a long time ago. When he asks us why we are curious, we can say that we're trying to find out where the vault is that the water flask came from. And he says, well, hell, if it's a vault you're looking for, then there's one right inside the walls of Vault City. It's not Vault 13, but it is a vault. It may not be the one that we are looking for, but the vault's central computer might know where it is. They have damn near everything listed on the computers there. All right, so our water flask lead has gone cold, but we've got a new lead now. The computer's inside the vault here at Vault City. That seems promising. I think we'll stick around for a while. We can ask Ed here about the place. He says it's okay if you can deal with the citizens. He doesn't agree with some of their views, but he makes a pretty good living here. His occupation is straightforward. He sells Brahmin to people who need them. Helps him pay the rent on this place. And that's as far as Ed can help us. So moving right, we see a tent on the other side of the street. Inside, there's a man lying flat on his back. Cough, cough, he says. We can inspect his belongings here, but everything is empty. Our pip boy says that his name is Puking Charlie. He looks terribly sick, but we're not sure what's wrong. We can use our doctor skill on him repeatedly until we discover that the man is suffering from radiation poisoning. Our skills as a doctor can't help him. He needs medication. We earn a hundred experience for discovering it, but in order to cure him, we need some Rataway. If we have Rataway already, or once we get it, we can use it on him to cure his radiation sickness. If we do, he goes, Urk, ung, cough, cough, ung, eh, What happened? I feel tons better. Thanks, stranger. I appreciate your help. I couldn't afford the auto dock. 
Wish I could reward you, but I ain't even got two caps to rub together. That'll be the last time I drink the damned water in this town, that's for sure. Surprised I still ain't glowing. Damn Radaway gives me the runs. So this poor old guy, Pukin' Charlie, got sick by drinking the town's water. Is it that badly irradiated? Moving right, we see a young boy standing outside this shack. I lost my friend while playing in the courtyard. His name is Mr. Nixon. Mr. Nixon has a blue shirt and a big nose. He's really, really short. Then he sniffs. <laughs> Okay, guess we have to keep our eyes out for Mr. Nixon. Then, in a nearby tent, we hear a woman say, What am I going to do? What do you want, she says. We can say, Are you okay? You look upset. And then she gives us a sad tale. It's her husband Joshua, you see. He got into some trouble at the bar. He accidentally struck a Vault City citizen and was arrested. He didn't mean to, but he'd been drinking and... If we say that he was drunk and attacked someone, so he should be arrested, she retorts, but it was an accident. He didn't mean to do it. We can be unsympathetic with her, in which case she doesn't give us the quest, or we can say, where is he now? And she tells us that he's inside the city, in the Servant Allocation Center. They say that he can work off his prison sentence as a servant, but that would take years. When we ask her what can be done about this situation, she says that she doesn't have much money left. The money she does have, she has to use to pay the guards for protection. Without the money, she'll have to leave. The only other option, if she wants to stay with Joshua, is she and her son can become servants too. And we say, hey, that sounds like a solution. They treat servants pretty well in Vault City, don't they? But she says, I don't want my son to be raised as a slave. We came to Vault City because we heard it was a free city. But we get here and there's all these laws and payments to the guards and it's nothing like we were told. We can offer to help. We can say, I'll see what I can do, all right? Maybe I can talk with someone at the allocation center. And she says that the man in charge is Barkus, Officer Barkus. She can't even get inside the city to see Joshua. She doesn't even know if he's all right. There is another way to solve her problem. When she says that she doesn't have much money, we can say, I could help you, but it's gonna cost you. And she says, but I don't have much money and, but we can interrupt. I wasn't talking about money, we can say. And she says, what do you mean? Oh no, I, I couldn't. I mean, I, do you want your husband free or don't you? Your husband never has to know, we can say. And she says, if you promise to free my husband, I... Very well. Close the tent flap. I think my son is still playing outside, so we won't be disturbed. With that, the screen fades to black, and when we return, she says, please rescue Joshua. He's inside the city in the Servant Allocation Center. No matter how we choose to accept this quest, we now have to go deeper into the city to find her husband. And we gotta find Mr. Nixon, wherever he is. Heading north of the tent and passing by her son, we can head towards the bar. It's a much larger structure. The bar patrons don't say much. They all recycle the same dialogue. They continue to talk about the drought, but the man behind the counter is a chatty sort of fellow. Well now, I ain't seen you around before, stranger. Name's Cassidy. I run the place. What can I do for you? We can say that we're looking for a vault, and he says, vault? The only vault I know of is the one inside the city. Big friggin' hole, you can't miss it, trust me. We can ask him about his business. He sells beer and whiskey, nothing special. When we ask him if he knows about anything interesting going on, he says, interesting? Heh, <laughs> friend, Vault City ain't an interesting place. Unless the guards get bored, then you better take cover. Why you ask him? Are you looking for something in this sinkhole? It can't be that bad, we can say, and he says, oh really? Well, hell then, I must be mistaken. Considering you're the authority and all, guess you must have been here napping during the raid last week. We can say, raid? What raid? And he says, oh yeah, beautiful sight it was. A guard patrol came in here looking for illegal substances, quote unquote. They busted down my door, busted up my stock, and then busted up a few of my customers too. What happened after that, Cassidy, we can say? And he says after they hauled away this one guy, Joshua, for resisting arrest, they find my ass for finding, get this, real whiskey on the premises. Never mind that I got a permit from Stark three months before. The bastards. Whoa, no kidding, we can say. And he says, wait, it gets better. Now I'm in debt to the guards for the fine. 
and I had to buy a new case of alcohol from a merchant at triple my standard rate. I'm expecting the guards to come knocking again soon just to bust my chops. We can say, man, that's awful, but what's it like here most of the time? Cassidy says, even the good days aren't worth a damn. The citizens don't drink much, so I'm stuck here pouring drinks for merchants. The next cheap son of a gun who haggles for a drink is going to be wearing his ass as a hat. Why are you here if you hate it so much, we can ask? And he says, I have a bad heart. I need cardio booster shots to keep it beating. The city's the only place to get real medical care, so I thought I'd settle here and try to make a living. You sound pretty fed up with this place, we can say. And he says, makes me want to close up shop and let this city rot. Screw them all. Well, then why don't you leave, Cassidy? And he says, going into the wastes by myself? Ha! I'm sick of this place, but I ain't stupid. But then we can say, hey, you know, I'm heading out that way again soon. Why don't you come along? Heh. <laughs> You serious, he says? And we can say, sure, why the hell not? You look like you know how to take care of yourself in a fight. And he says, all right, count me in. We can say, let's hit it. And then Cassidy joins us as a new permanent companion. Cassidy is one of the best companions in Fallout 2. And yes, he is related to that Cassidy. He is the father of Rose of Sharon Cassidy from Fallout New Vegas. Dad ran a bar a long time ago and it was a labor of love, Mom said. Didn't sound like it made her happy. Still, I'm guessing I got some of Dad's love of whiskey in me because the burn suits me fine. If you want to learn exactly what his relationship was like with his daughter, you can watch my character profile video on Cass by clicking here. Long story short, they didn't know each other very well. Cassidy is a down-to-earth kind of guy. He's no goody two-shoes, but if you want him to stick around, just don't be too evil. He has a heart condition, so you can't give him any drugs, except for basic healing things like stim packs. When you talk with him, he says that he's great with spears and shotguns, but he's pretty handy with most small guns. I gave him shotguns towards the beginning of my gameplay and kept him stocked with shells, but he's also deadly with a sniper rifle. Keeping him at medium range with a rifle is a great way to use the guy. At end game, when he's fully leveled up, he has the highest small guns and energy weapon skill of any of our other possible companions. So later in the game, giving him an energy pistol or rifle will make him devastating. Now that Cassidy's a companion, we can loot his place. We find a desk in his bedroom and it's locked, but after picking it, inside we find some shotgun shells and some whiskey. Cass doesn't seem to mind that we take it. Of course, I put all this in his inventory anyway, so I suppose that's why. And in his bookshelf, we find a copy of Guns and Bullets and Cat's Paw Magazine. Oh, Cassidy. Some light bedside reading, perhaps? Heading outside, we find something lying on the ground right next to his shack. It's hard to see, we just see a yellow outline, but our Pip-Boy tells us that it's a Mr. Nixon doll. Well, what do you know, we found Mr. Nixon. Inspecting it in our inventory, oh, that's Mr. Nixon. You see a small doll with a big red nose. For some reason, you don't trust this seemingly innocent child's toy. Really, Nixon became a child's toy in the Fallen Universe, okay. Well, with the doll in hand, we can return it to the small boy, whose mother lives in the tent. She's the one trying to find her husband, Joshua. I lost Mr. Nixon and I don't know where I left him, he says. And we can say, I have Mr. Nixon right here. But you know what? I think Mr. Nixon should be punished for going off on his own. Some ritual dismemberment may be in order. So first, I'm gonna pull off his arms. Then, and the boy says, no, no, don't, stop it, stop, whoopsie. Looks like Nixon was a little more fragile than I thought. Too bad, kid. And as we walk away, the kid says, Mr. Nixon will come back from the grave and kill you. Mr. Nixon will haunt you for the rest of your days. And I mean it. <laughs> oh, poor kid. We destroyed his Mr. Nixon. Incidentally, this exchange was recreated in Fallout New Vegas. If you go to the fort, we find a little girl slave minding the Brahmin who lost her toy teddy bear. We can go through the same thing with her. I covered it in a video when I did the full story of Caesar's Legion, which you can watch here. Or we could be a decent human being and just say, hey, is this him? He was looking for you too. And give the Mr. Nixon doll to the poor boy. You found him, he says, you found Mr. Nixon. Sure I did, kid. He didn't go far. Now keep an eye on him from now on, okay? And with that, the boy is reunited with his Mr. Nixon. Thanks for finding Mr. Nixon. He says thanks, too. All right. I'm feeling the warm fuzzies. 
But if we stick around, we can observe the child have a conversation with Mr. Nixon. Would you like some tea, Mr. Nixon? And the toy says, Why, yes, I would like one. Thank you, Curtis. In this way, we learn the boy's name is Curtis. Here you go. Drink up. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Nixon, says the young boy. And then he says, Do you want to go dig up Daddy's wrench? No, Mr. Nixon. Daddy would be mad that we buried it. But it's buried under those rocks behind the bar. We could go get it right now. No, Daddy will be mad. It's best to lie. Just like you told me, Mr. Nixon. <laughs> okay. So from this exchange, we learn that young Curtis here buried his father Joshua's wrench under some rocks by the bar. Let's see if we can find it. Heading north, we can go all the way around the bar, but we don't see much. Though we do see a pile of rocks just to the east of the bar, inspecting it. The chosen one says, hey, I found a wrench buried under these rocks. All right, so we've got a wrench. An expensive tool, good for resale or good as a makeshift weapon. But instead of selling it, we'll save it for later. Who knows? It may come in handy. Moving on, we can head north of Cassidy's bar. Here we find a tent and a man standing outside of it. Don't think I've seen you around before, stranger. The name's Smith. Help you with something? When we ask him to tell us about Vault City, he says, well, what you see here ain't really Vault City. You're actually standing in the city's courtyard. Oh, so we haven't actually entered town yet. Okay. Why aren't you in the city? We can ask. And he says, me and the family ain't the kind of people they let in there. So we live here under their protection. They're from the wasteland, you see. Wastelanders like ourselves. We wastelanders could never become Vault City citizens. So the best he and we could ever get from them is protection. Protection we have to pay for. The Vault City guards keep them safe from the outside. But that safety costs him and his wife quite a bit. And without a plow, well, making ends meet is really difficult. When we ask him if we can help him get a plow, he says, you'd help people like us? We can't offer much, but we sure would appreciate it. When we ask him where we can find one, he says, there's a plow over near the guns and ammo store. Harry might be selling it. If we ask for payment to do this favor for him, he says that he only has about $150 saved. But if he gives that to us to get the plow, he won't be able to make his next protection payment to the guards, unless he gets a plow by next week. Moving west of here, we find the clinic, and inside we find the doctor. He can heal us up, sadly we can't barter with him, and he tells us that there are actually two doctors in the shack, himself and the old doctor in the back. When we ask him, old doctor, what do you mean by that? He says, yeah, the auto doc in the back room there. It's a loner from the city. It can be a little ornery sometimes, but mostly it does the job. Mostly. Heading into the back room with the auto doc, we find a desk locked with a difficult lock. If we pick it, we find some radix, some antidote, some money and a stim pack. Then inspecting the machine, we see an ancient looking auto dock. It's clicking and whirring unhealthily and a great deal of heat is emanating from it. So the auto dock is busted. We can try to use our repair skill to repair the auto dock, or if Vic is a companion, he can try to repair it for us. And after many failed attempts, we're finally successful. The damage wasn't as bad as it seemed. Some interior cables needed to be replaced and the diagnostic board cleaned, no problem. We gain 100 experience points. But aside from the experience, we don't get any other reward. However, this encounter goes differently if your character has low intelligence and high luck. After repairing the auto dock, when we talk with the clinic doctor to use the auto dock, he'll ask us if we want to get patched up. To say yes, our low intelligence character can say, patch. He goes, all right, well, from the looks of it, it's gonna cost 225 bucks. You got the cash, then you're good to go. Our low intelligence character can say, Patch, Patch, take money, fix leaks. Let's get to it then, says the doctor. I'll just hook you up to the old auto dock here. Slip your arms into the slots there. Then I'll tighten the braces and secure the clamps. When done, he says, all right, knew the old doctor wouldn't let you down, but the chosen one fails to understand what just happened. Me want to ride again. Again, says the chosen one. Uh, well, now that might not be the safest thing for you, friend, says the doctor. Seems like you already took a few trips in the old doctor from the way you talk. But if you want to, and we ride again. Only this trip, we gain plus two to our maximum HP. The doctor says, uh, how do you feel? Any better? Any worse? 
Me feel like maxed up points increase, so me fine for now, bye. And if we choose that option, we can walk away with our new permanent health buff. Or we can say, again, again, again. And the doctor says, oh, well, okay, but I warned you last time that it might not be safe. If we continue, the doctor says, uh-oh, looks like the old doctor took a pound of flesh this time. And we lose minus two to our maximum HP. We can respond by saying, erk, me hurt inside. Me never want to ride in bad thing again. So what happens here is we get a unique perk depending on the stats of our low intelligence character. If we have less than four intelligence and at least nine luck, then after riding the auto dock, we gain plus two to maximum HP. If however, we have 10 in luck and less than four intelligence, we get plus four to our maximum HP. But then of course, as you just saw, if we choose to ride again, we lose either of the perks that we got. So to keep them, we gotta walk away after our first ride. This auto dock is also what we use to remove our mutated toe. If you recall in my episode on the town of Klamath, there we found the toxic caves and the toxic caves were so toxic that if we walked around without rubber boots on, our feet began to tingle. After a few months of in-game time, we sprout a sixth toe. It's not that big of a deal, but it does have some in-game ramifications, which we'll talk about later. But we can use this auto dock to remove the sixth toe. If we do, the mutated toe is added as a new inventory item. You see your sixth toe. It's a small mutated part of yourself. For some reason, you feel a terrible sense of loss as you look at the tiny amputated toe. And it weighs an entire one pound. Wow, that is one heavy toe. And it's an aid item. We can eat it. <laughs> if we do, we become poisoned. It removes three to our maximum HP and adds two to our current poison level. And it takes seven days for our HP to recover. Moving out of the clinic, we see a well, but there's no way we can interact with it. And so moving west from here, we can explore the shack just north of Ed's Brahmin farm. This is Happy Harry's weapon and ammo store. Heading inside, we find Happy Harry behind the counter. Well, hello there. What can I do for you? He says. This is the guy Mr. Smith told us that we could get a plow from. We can mention this to him. Are you still selling that plow out there? And he says, yes, I am. I'll let it go, say, for $800. We can say, forget it, the Smiths can starve. Or we can try to barter with him. I'll give you $600, we can say. But he says, sorry, it's going to cost you $800. So unless we can pass that barter check, we got to fork out $800. Bucks. It's yours, says Happy Harry. He pockets the money. And he says, are you just going to take it or do you need it delivered somewhere? We'll have him drop it off at the Smiths. With the item secured, we can head back to Mr. Smith to check in with him. Thank you kindly, he says. Here's a little something my pa gave me before he left this world. With the guards protecting us, we don't need it. But you might be able to make some use of it. With that, we earn 250 experience. And Mr. Smith gives us a 44 caliber Desert Eagle. However, if we insisted upon a reward before accepting this quest, he only gives us the money. He doesn't give us the Desert Eagle. Back to Happy Harry's, we never had a chance to inspect his shop inventory. He's got a pretty decent selection. Grenades, booze, flares, explosives, ammunition for a range of handguns, and a selection of small arms, low to mid game armor, and even some energy weapon ammunition. So a great little merchant for this stage in the game. Leaving the shop, I discovered a fun conversation with Cassidy while I was asking him about the types of weapons he liked to use. He can use shotguns and rifles, and he says, between you and me, I can also use a spear pretty good. Me and my buddies used to hunt rat scorpions with spears way back, and the fact that I'm alive and they ain't might tell you something. We note his apprehension, his cautiousness when telling us that he can use a spear, and we can say, hey, there's nothing wrong with using a spear. And he explains by saying, well, I don't want people to mistake me for old Bone Nose over there. He's talking about Sulik. I ain't never seen no tribal do something as dumb as jam a bone in his nose. The chosen one can say, did you know that I'm a tribal? And Cassidy says, ah, oh, don't be playing with old Cassidy now. You ain't no tribal. And we can say, uh, yeah, yeah, I am. And he says, oh, well, damn it all. You can have my apology right here and now. I didn't mean no offense. We can say, don't worry about it. And he says, well, now, before you go, I got a question for you. What are we doing out here? We seem to be running all over the place looking for something. Have we got some sort of plan? And we can explain the plot to him. We can say we're looking for a Gek. 
A Garden of Eden creation kit. My village needs it to restore their crops. All he says is, them things come in kits now, huh? Man, the good book don't mention that, does it? Well, all right then, let's get hunting. <laughs> With that, we explore the courtyard of Vault City. And now we need to take the exit grid to the north to enter Vault City proper. We see that the city looks new, clean, pure. The gate is guarded by two guards. We find a customs house to the right. And inside, we see a man in a vault suit standing by a chair. Look, outsider, if you've got customs business, Wallace is in the back there, okay? He'll set you up with all the forms you need. We can say, well, what is this place? And he says, this is the customs office, like the sign outside says. If you haven't got customs business, what are you doing here? We can say that we're looking for the vault, and he says, the vault? It's inside the city, why? You, uh, looking to get past the gate? When we say yes, he says, well, you could see my boss, Wallace, and try to get permission to get inside, but you'd be wasting your time. He never lets anyone in. Of course, there are other ways. When we ask for him to clarify, he says, if you've got the cash, then I'll go into detail. Otherwise, when we say that we've got the money, but we want to know what he's selling, and he says, for 200 bucks, I can make you a full-fledged citizen. You'll have free passage through the gate, no hassles. I can print out the papers, register your serial number, and have you on your way in five minutes. When we ask him what it takes to become a real citizen, he says, if you're not born a citizen, then you have to take a test to become a citizen. The number of outsiders that have taken the test and become citizens, zero. Your chances, less than zero. When we say, what is this test? He says, Gregory the Proconsul gives a test to any outsiders who want to become citizens. It measures their intelligence and their perception, and you have to be damned lucky to pass it too. Most citizens would have trouble with it. Why is it so hard, we can ask, and he says, since most outsiders can't read, do trigonometry, or spell Australopithecus, you figure it out. It's just an excuse to keep outsiders from becoming citizens. We can buy one from him. Sounds good, here's $200. All right, says Skeev, they're all done printing. Here you are, citizen, and don't tell anyone about this, especially Wallace, all right? This conversation goes very differently with a low intelligence character. When we first talk with him, and he asks us about forms, we can respond, Firms need? And Skeev says, look, Dim, just get at it. Hmm, wait a minute. Maybe... Her? Come with me a second, Dim. I've got somebody you gotta meet. Okie dokie, we can say. And we appear inside Vault City at the Servant Allocation Center. Skeev says, Found this bunch wandering the waste, Barkus. This one outsider here looks like good servant material. And Barkus says, You have to be kidding me. It's obviously retarded. And the Chosen One says, Retarded. Poo. Come on, says Skeev. You need someone to work the vault, don't you? Vault. Gek, says the Chosen One. Barkus says, well, hmm, I suppose you'll be expecting a finder's fee. And Skeev says, do outsiders eat their own feces? Of course I want a finder's fee. Fee? Pee, says the chosen one. Very well, says Barkus. I'll send it off to the vault then. Maybe it can clear up the storerooms. And with that, we appear inside Vault 8, which is incredibly hard to get into any other way. And so since I don't want to skip ahead episodes into the future, we'll save what happens to a low intelligence character inside Vault 8 for when I cover Vault 8. But for a normal intelligence character, we still have to find a way to get inside Vault City, let alone inside Vault 8, back inside the customs office. Before we make any rash decisions like buying forged paperwork from Skeev here, we'll talk with Wallace on the other side of this door. Hello, traveler, says Wallace. Welcome to Vault City. Is there anything I can help you with? He says, the name's Wallace. I'm the customs officer for Vault City. I accommodate those who wish to conduct business within our great walls. What do you mean by accommodate, we can say? And he says, this is the customs office. We're responsible for keeping a log of all the goods that come to us via the caravans and supervising all transactions. All merchants must pass through customs before entering the city. He then gives us a breakdown of all of the caravans and trading that comes from the wasteland here to Vault City. They get servants from the den, and since we've been to the den, we know that those servants are actually slaves. They get uranium from Broken Hills, and they trade for metal ore from Redding. Broken Hills is a mining town to the south. Their mutants mine for uranium and then ship it here by caravan. 
Redding is a mining town to the west. Their merchants used to be really pleasant to deal with, but their shipments of ore have slowed considerably as of late. It has the people of Vault City worried. They depend on ore from Redding a great deal. The leader here at Vault City is First Citizen Joanne Lynette. She's been serving the city for over 10 years. Her primary job is to keep the people of the city untainted by the outside world. She has to keep the city strong. There are many threats. First of all, the NCR is pressuring them to join the Republic, and there are lots of nearby raider attacks. And then on top of it all, there's a big problem coming from the nearby town of Gecko. The NCR, or the New California Republic, is attempting to unify all of California under one government. But the people of Vault City aren't interested. They have their own town. It's strong and protected from the wasteland. They don't see any need to join the NCR. They see the NCR as being cutthroats and thieves. All they want is to drain Vault City of its resources. The raider problem has been getting worse. They used to have attacks in the past, but recently they've become more brutal. For the first time, Wallace fears that they may breach the city's laser turret defenses. The problem is they don't know anything about these raiders. They don't know where the raiders are striking from. The only other person who might know where the raiders are coming from is Citizen Sergeant Stark, but he's deeper in the city, in the Corrections Center. Here we find an option, since they don't know where the raiders are, to track down the raiders in exchange for being allowed into the city. And Wallace agrees. He says, yeah, you find their base camp, and I'll grant you a day pass. But there are other ways to get in the city, as we will soon see. The building to the left of the customs office is a guardhouse. There's just one guard inside. And approaching the gate, we can talk with the guards. Stop right there, friend, he says. No one is allowed past this point without proper authorization. He says we can't get in unless we have a day pass, which we can get from Wallace. With a day pass, we can conduct business in the city until night falls. Then we gotta hightail it out of there, or else the guards will attack. From here, there are a number of ways we can proceed. Heading back to the customs office, we can talk to the guy who offered to forge us false citizenship papers. His name is Skeev. We find an option here to say, I've decided to turn you in for selling fake citizenship papers. And he says, what the? Nobody's gonna believe you, outsider. It'll be your word over mine. And we can say, I sure hope so, because I can be pretty persuasive. And he says, I, what, you dirty. Careful there, I'd watch your tongue if I were you, we can say. Alternatively, if we buy the fake citizenship papers from Skeev here, it's much easier to intimidate him. When he says, I'd like to see you try, Wallace will never believe you, we find an option to say, oh, I think he will once he sees the fake citizenship papers that you gave me. Of course, if you happen to have some cash on you, it can be our little secret. Skeev says, all right, I got a little cash stashed away. Here, take it. 300 bucks. Now you're gonna keep quiet. No problem, we can say you have my silence. We get the caps, but after making this decision, Skeev just says, beat it, I've got nothing to say to you. Which means we can no longer get his forged citizenship papers. We now have to find another way to get in. So if we want the forged papers, it's better to buy them from him first before blackmailing him. Or if we put on our Vault 13 jumpsuit, we can convince him that we're a vault dweller from another vault. Heading back to Wallace, he says, why, you're wearing an original vault suit. And we can say, yes, I am. And you won't believe what I had to go through to get the damn thing. He says, here, take this day pass and go speak with our first citizen. I'm sure she'll have many questions for you. And we can say, thanks. I think I'll have some questions for her too. We can get in easily as a low intelligence character, Heading into Wallace, he says, what can I help you with? And we can say, Fraz, herb lol. Well, says Wallace, I see I'll have to have a talk with the guards in the courtyard. They seem to be letting just about any outsider into Vault City nowadays. Days, days, daisy. Daisy, you say? How fascinating, says Wallace. Why don't you go back to the courtyard and tell the rest of your inbred outsider friends about it? Okay, we can say. But then Wallace says, actually, now that I think about it, maybe you better leave your weapons and armor here, just for the safety of Vault City. A car, we can say. Better do the armor first, so, hey, hey, what's that you're wearing underneath your armor? Huh, we can say. Wh why, you're wearing an original vault suit. Yup, vault suit warm, like mom. And we get the same response, and we get a day pass for free. 
Another way is to simply use our skills. If we sneak up behind Wallace, we can try to pickpocket a day pass from him. Or if we head to the locker in the southeastern corner of the room, we have to make sure that we are hidden on the other side of it. But if we are, we can pick the lock to also find another day pass. We also find $130, a stim pack, and a first aid kit. I read that we could get a day pass by pretending that we're traders. This dialogue option is supposed to appear if we have a golden gecko pelt, refined geranium ore, or a gold nugget in our inventory. But every time I tried this, I never got Wallace to acknowledge it. The final option I was able to trigger is to pass a speech check with Wallace. We find an option to say, it's very important that you let me in to speak with your leader. He says, well, of course, everyone desires an audience with the first citizen. Sadly, her time is only for matters of the utmost importance. In the following conversations, we find many pitfalls. But the correct way to pass this speech check is to say, that's why it's vital that I speak to her. I'll be sure to throw in a good word about how efficiently the customs office is being run. But if you can't help me, then... And he says, well, I didn't say I couldn't help you. It's just that, well, what's the purpose of your visit? And the only way to proceed is to say, I can't tell it to you personally, officer, as much as I'd like to. It's for the first citizen's ears alone. That is why it's vital that I speak with her. And he says, hmm, well, this is most irregular. And we say, I wouldn't trouble you if it wasn't a matter of extreme urgency, officer. I'll be sure to mention how helpful you were when I speak to the first citizen. And he complies. Well, this certainly seems to be a matter for the first citizen. Here's your day pass. It's only good during the day. At night, you'll be asked to leave the city. Citizens also reserve the right to cancel day pass privileges at any time. So behave yourself. If we chose to buy the forged papers from Skeev, even if we blackmailed him and took his $300, at any time we can turn him into Wallace. Your assistant Skeev is involved in illegal practices. And he says, who are you to be accusing a vault citizen of anything? And we can say, well, he sold me these fake citizenship papers. Here, look. And Wallace is dumbstruck. Skeev? This is how I'm repaid for taking him in as my son. He shall be dealt with, I assure you. And with that, the screen fades to black, and Skeev disappears. <laughs> but this way we're out fake citizenship papers. With that, we either have a day pass or fake citizenship papers to get inside Vault City. If we try to use the fake citizenship papers, we find a number of ways to mess up. Heading to the guard, he says, day pass, please. And we say, I don't need a day pass. I am a citizen. He says, citizen, let me see your papers. We hand them over, and he says, well, these all look legit, but funny, I don't recall ever seeing you around here before. There are many ways to fail here. If we say, hmm, well, perhaps you should be more observant. I have an appointment with the first citizen, and he's expecting me. We fail because the first citizen is actually a woman. If we're rude and we say that we hope he'll remember next time, or if we're snarky and say, why, yes, I hold citizenship of all of the vaults. He says, I don't know who you are, but you're no citizen. He confiscates our papers and says we have to get a day pass like everyone else. The only way to get the papers to work is to be kind to the guard and say, we must have missed each other. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Alternatively, we can hand him our day pass, which is much cheaper and easier to get. But before he allows us in, he says, all right, before you go in, we have to search your belongings first. What for, we can say... Sometimes outworlders try to smuggle alcohol or habit-forming chems into Vault City. Buff out jet, psycho, mentats, that sort of thing. If we say forget it, we are not allowed in, the only way to proceed is to allow him to search. If he doesn't find any booze or chems on our inventory, he says we're clean and we can head on in. One way to get around this check is to simply put all of our booze and chems on a companion's inventory. For some reason, he inspects us, but not our companions. With that, the gate slides open, and we can finally enter Vault City. But with that, we're all out of time. We'll have to explore Vault City to see if we can find a way to get inside their vault in our next episode. I publish many videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you feel like you're still missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts 
shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.